I'd like to welcome you all to KIC, especially to those of you who are visiting. The uh, Connected Intelligence Center is uh, an innovation lab to help the university take advantage of analytics and data science and AI. Um, and one of the things we're very interested in is whether we can assess rigorously 21st century skills, one of which, of course, would be collaboration. Another one would be problem solving. And that's our interest in the Swarm platform. And this is why I'm so pleased to welcome Tim Van Gelder here, as well as his colleague, Richard de Rosario, um, who are both leading the uh, Swarm project. Tim will explain to you what they've been doing, achieving some quite remarkable results. Uh, and then we'll be throwing open the question, what would this look like at UTS, for example, if we were to deploy it in faculties to try and assess authentic collaborative problem solving? Uh, and of course, here at, UT, uh, here at KIC, we have a particular interest in learning analytics, how the analytics traces that participants leave as they engage in these tasks could assist us in helping them improve their performance and in us understanding what they're doing. Okay. so. Without further ado, I'm not even going to start on Tim's extensive CV and all the things he's done, but you can look him up. But Tim is one of the leading thinkers in the world, in my view, in critical thinking and in how you build usable software to augment that performance. So it's fantastic to have you here, Tim. We've known each other a long time. My pleasure to have you here in KIC. Let's welcome Tim. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I've got a slide deck here. Uh, I know it's a huge screen, so I assume that's why everybody's sort of back in the back of the room, just so you can see uh, what's there. But, um, but there's so many slides here, that, uh, so I'm going to have to rush through various parts and, and uh, jump around a bit. Uh, there was, we did a, a, another session earlier in the day um, over at the Faculty of Transdisciplinary Innovation, which I think is such a great name, that that's where I want to be, you know, is in that faculty. Uh, but um, Connected intelligence is pretty cool too. Uh, but <laughs> uh, so there's a few people were there. Uh, I apologise for overlap uh, between the two uh, uh, sessions. But the, the diff one difference between this morning and, and now is that um, uh, I'll, I'll make some comments about Swarm as an environment for learning. It, it hasn't been our, our intention to build this to be a learning environment, but lo and behold, people seem to be learning stuff. And I'll, I'll talk about in how that seems to be working. Um, so uh, we, um, Richard and I, are, are members of this very newly created thing, the Hunt Lab. The Hunt Lab is just a group of researchers at the University of Melbourne who came together via uh, funding from the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity, uh, which uh, you may or may not have heard of, but you probably have heard of DARPA, the Defence Advanced Research Projects Activity, and about 10 years ago, the US intelligence uh, community set up IARPA to be very similar to DARPA, but focused on intelligence. And they fund pure research, right? So it's not classic, or generally speaking, it's not you know, classified. It, it's just uh, um, uh, pure blue sky, high risk research. Uh, by high risk, you know, they think there's a good chance it, it, it won't happen, but uh, it won't succeed. But if it does succeed, there's potentially large payoff for the intelligence community. And they expect many of the, of the research projects they fund to fail, and sometimes they complain they're not failing enough. Uh, so one, one aspect of, of IARPA, very important, is that when they fund a project, they typically uh, fund some research teams to you know, uh, try their best. And they also fund an independent test and evaluation team whose sole job is to be independent of IARPA, be independent of, of, the, of the so-called performers, and to, to verify that this stuff is working as intended. So um, uh, we started off couple, two years ago, start of 2017, in a 4.5 year program. It, it's a large program with generous funding. Um, we are, uh, my, my background is philosophy, and uh, you know, philosophy is not the biggest program on campus, as you probably know. Um, Richard and I, pre prior to that, were just in a little consulting business, and a uh, very rapid transition into a situation where we're, we're basically managing a program which is larger than most philosophy departments in, in the country uh, with around about 30 people uh, you know, on, on our team. 
So uh, that, that's pretty exciting. Uh, they started off with four performer teams at the start of 2017. End of last year, they did a, um, a Survivor Island, right? You, you either perform or you don't. And then they made the cut. And the other three teams were all dropped. So we're the last surviving team in this 4.5 year program. We're into phase two. We've, we've still got a test and evaluation team, but now their sole job is to test us. Right? So fortunately, they're nice, friendly, sensible, intelligent people. Uh, we get on well with them. It's a, it's a friendly collaboration uh, while trying to maintain that, that, uh, that independence. So, um, uh, that's probably enough of the, of the context. What I'm going to do now, I'll put on my glasses. I'm going to, oh, actually, I'll, I'm pressing the arrow, but nothing happens. Um, just press the, uh, okay. Uh, that was just that stuff. Um, the program that's funding us is called CREATE. And that's, a, as you'd expect, an acronym. It's a, a, a contrived acronym. But basically what they want to is, is a fundamental advance in analytic reasoning. Analytic reasoning, the kind of reasoning that intelligence analysts do when they look at a whole lot of evidence and they draw conclusions and they write up those conclusions into a report that gets submitted to a, a decision maker. In the US intelligence community, uh, we recently read, there are 50,000 intelligence products produced every year. Right, so this is, a, this is a machine for generating knowledge. And uh, they, uh, people in the intelligence community, both in, in the United States and here, are very are well aware that this machine, uh, well, yeah, it kind of works, but it has all sorts of issues. And intelligence is a tough business, right? You're trying to understand the way of the world works and the way it will work. And, and, that's, and the world is a very complicated place. It's really hard to be consistently right about that stuff. Um, so they know they're never going to be perfect, but they're well aware that they could be doing better than they are in intelligence analysis. And, uh, and that's why CREATE, IAPRA through CREATE, wants to say, look, how could we really change the game, right? How could we make a, a, um, a quantum leap in performance? Uh, well, they, um, I'll, I'll say uh, we've got um, slides that were created on Window is now showing on. Is this a Mac or not? No. Yeah, it is. So I don't know. They're, they're all messed up. Um, uh, the uh, I'll say just more because this is a learning environment. I'll, I'll say a bit more about what uh, uh, this notion of a fundamental advance. Um, we they didn't define fundamental advance. Uh, it was kind of like we'll know it when we see it, uh, and uh, we said, well, what would it mean? to have a fundamental advance in intelligence analysis, in analytical reasoning and intelligence context. And for our own internal purposes, we operationalize this concept using this notion of a one standard deviation gain in performance. So remember this 50,000 reports? Well, let's say you're the CIA and 20,000 of those reports are, are produced in your organization. There's a distribution of quality. And if you could shift that distribution upwards, by one standard deviation in the current distribution, that would be, it doesn't sound like much, but that would be a fundamental advance in performance. And, and one reason, uh, you know, that, that number one, it sounds like a nice round number and an arbitrary choice, but it's actually grounded in, in some, um, uh, some empirical observations. One of my favorites is the, uh, all the evidence on um, attempts to improve learning, uh, generally speaking. Now, some of you, anybody come across this hack, John Hattie's uh, uh, meta-analysis of meta-analyses and so forth? This, this is the results um, of some, uh, he synthesized the results of 800 different meta-analyses of attempts to improve learning in education. And, uh, and then he's, uh, from that synthesis, he's ranked hundreds, uh, how many, um, 252 different ways that you could try to improve learning. Rank them in terms of the effect size that you get according to the meta-analyses of those methods. Right? So this is, this is a massive amount of data squashed into a single thing. And uh, what it, it's, it's quite interesting, You're, the, uh, the median is around 0.4. And uh, John Hattie says, look, if you, 
If you're thinking about doing something to improve education, if, if the expected expect size is, is less than 0.4, don't, don't, why would you? Don't bother. You know, there, there are other things you could do. Um, the, uh, uh, at the very top, you'll see there's a bit of a, a bump. Right, there's, there's a bit of a, uh, you can see that. Th that's, that's I've, I've enlarged here. I need to stick by this. I've enlarged the, uh, that, that very top section. And you'll see that the apps out of 252 ways you might improve learning, the, the six or eight top ones are all hovering around one standard deviation. I mean, you know, in other words, getting one standard deviation is an enormous achievement. I mean, it is, this is really exceptional. Okay, so that, that's one reason to think this is a tough benchmark to set yourself, right? One standard deviation gain. So um, uh, that, that's how we're looking at it. Now, what I'm gonna do is actually jump, uh, jump around a bit here. I'm gonna rapidly, um, I'll come back to all this stuff, uh, but I want to talk about the evaluation that we did. Whoops, I went too far. Just go back a bit. Almost there. Okay. Last year, uh, we ran an exercise which was designed uh, to test whether our system actually produces better reasoning. Okay. And the way we did that is say, okay, we're going to give, we're going to have uh, the system that we, we've developed, uh, we're going to put teams of analysts. So part of our idea is, or part of Create's idea actually, is, is that you, you may get better analysis if you use teams or groups of people. As long as you can coordinate their activity suitably, uh, then it, you know you probably should be able to get significant gains by using groups rather than individuals. So, okay, so so we ran, we, we designed a platform around this idea, and we uh, ran a large exercise where we recruited a whole lot of teams. In fact, we ended up with 24 teams ranging in size from from about 14 or 15 through to about 30 uh, people, or 15 to 40, uh, 600 total participants in 24 teams, and. Um, we wanted to see if the performance on the platform was, in, in terms of the quality of the reasoning of the products that they produced, was better than what they would have produced using their normal methods. Okay. So we set up this exercise where there are a lot of these people were, were, were professional analysts. Some of them were professional analysts within organisations, including um, a major intelligence organisation. And um, some of them were analysts we recruited off the internet. Uh, and uh, in the first week, we gave them a, uh, we had four different problems uh, over four weeks, but in the first week they were asked to do these problems using their normal methods. And then in the remaining three weeks, they got given problems uh, to, to do as teams on, on our platform, the Swarm platform. And uh, so, uh, uh, so they did that. Uh, we had uh, really good, um, uh, what we call delivery. I mean, there's, we had a few dropouts. We had lots of reports being produced. And um, each of these reports, we had rated, uh, we triple rated, that is, we, we trained some people to be raters of these reports. And we had a pool of those people. And every report, you know, the hundreds of reports, reports that were produced in this big exercise, each one of those was triple rated blindly by trained raters using the official rubric rating scale from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence in the United States. So we're trying to get a really, as objective a measure as we can of the quality of reasoning in these reports. And when I say they were blindly rated, they, it was uh, the raters didn't know whether this was produced on the platform or whether it was produced by individuals using their normal methods. Okay, we sort of removed the indicators as best we could of, of, of that. And um, so, um, we had a, uh, these 24 teams, we had a leaderboard so that they, they could see how they were going and uh, where they stood in the rankings. So this is, this is a tournament, right? And uh, as I said, there were 14 different organisations that had, had teams or part teams in here and they could, they could benchmark themselves against, in performance against teams recruited off the internet. Some of these teams from the internet were just 
non-analysts. They were just people who signed up. We didn't know who they were. They just, all we knew is they weren't professional analysts, right? And uh, so we were getting this benchmarking of, of serious intelligence people uh, against, you know, these, these internet teams. And uh, well, so the results were pretty interesting. Uh, when you aggregated it all together, uh, what we found was that the highest performing teams were the general public. The next highest performing teams were the professional analysts that we just recruited off the internet and stuck them randomly into teams. And the, the next highest performing teams were the teams from organizations, the teams who, for whom this is their job. <laughs> uh, so that was a bit sobering. Uh, we didn't predict that. Uh, now, I have to say in advance, um, this is not a rigorously sort of controlled thing. And uh, in particular, we, we, have, we think a lot of this effect is due to the, particularly the public teams. There were just some people who are really, really keen and put a lot of time and effort into it. So there was an effect of just the amount, sheer amount of time and effort. Uh, and that we know some of the organization teams were, you know, they were pretty minimal about it. But they got a rude shock, I mean, because they were seriously outclassed in their performance um, by, by these public teams, by, by these internet teams. Uh, and that, so that's a pretty interesting uh, result. But in terms of, look, is it real, how much is this really improving reasoning? Uh, the basic results were uh, shown in this graph. Um, over on the left, you can see the, uh, the distribution of, of quality scores in blue for normal methods and in orange for, the, uh, for, for reports produced on the swarm on the platform. You can just see eyeballing it. You know, there's clearly a shift in the distribution. How big is that shift? Turns out to be uh, 1.37 uh, standard deviations. Uh, so we're in, at least as indicated by this exercise, we're in the territory of a fundamental advance. Now, I don't, I, we're a long way from achieving that in real world circumstances in a real organization. So I'm not yet saying that we have delivered, but it's indicative of the kind of thing that can happen. Uh, so it was partly on the strength of these results that they decided to continue us into phase two. They're saying, well, something seems to be working here, right? This, this needs more, this deserves more support, right? And it, more, more elaboration, more testing. Uh, so, uh, so that's where we are. Um, what I'm going to do now is sort of jump all the way back and say, well, what is this system that I've been talking about? You know, and how does it work? How, how does it weave this, this, these magical results? And uh, so I'll, I'll flick back through my various slides. And now, um, as, as Simon knows, I spent a large part of my professional career uh, basically trying to argue that the problem with people's reasoning is it's too sloppy. Right? It's too messy. It's too unstructured. People would reason better if only the, the, their thinking could be more rigorously structured and boxed in and, and organised and, you know, if, if you could bring more discipline into, into people's thinking. That's how you get better thinking. Right. Uh, so I was for a long time working in this area called argument mapping. And argument mapping is saying, look, don't, don't just you know, uh, talk about what you think. Don't just write it out on a page. Actually structure it using this, this logical framework. Right. And uh, you can probably tell from the way I'm pitching this, this, this hasn't ended well. <laughs> uh, uh, that is to say, uh, already by the time we started here, this project, uh, Rich and I, you know, were having long discussions about how we were going to tackle this problem. And we were thinking, you know what, I think what we've learned over all these years is that trying to impose a whole lot of structure on people um, doesn't always work very well. Uh, and so, um, in, in a nutshell, uh, what we figured, this is, of course, reconstructing history and it's oversimplifying, but it's a good story. What we figured is the way to get these, uh, these kind of performance gains isn't by trying to impose structure on thinking, but rather by improving the collaboration. That is, if you can facilitate collective thinking, uh, that this will be the lowest hanging fruit, this will be the easiest path 
towards getting substantial gains. Now, you might be able to get further gains on top of that by introducing certain kinds of structure under certain circumstances. Yes, that's quite possible. In fact, it's, it's clearly true. But um, nevertheless, if you want to try to get uh, real gains in real working circumstances, um, you might be better off by um, taking a very different approach that says to people, look, you already have a lot of expertise in thinking. If you can work together effectively to pool your thinking uh, and aggregate your thinking, then that could get good results. And so when we compare that with what's done normally in intelligence, this is a, you know, it's a cartoon, it's a caricature, but, but this is roughly speaking a picture of your typical intelligence analyst at work, right? They're just sitting at the desk, they read all sorts of stuff, they're writing up their report, they'll finish their report and they'll hand it in and, um, and then it'll get some review from their managers and then eventually it'll go to the, um, uh, you know, to the decision maker. And it's very much an individual model. Now there is some collaboration, this is a caricature, but, but this, is, um, this is actually sort of the, if, if there was anything that was sort of the dominant approach, this, this would more or less be it. In fact, here's a more schematic version. Um, you, you might call it the individual with inputs model. And uh, so the, uh, this, is, this contrasts with a teamwork model where there's a very specific group of people who are designated as a team and have very well-defined roles and, 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 and team processes. And, you know, this is this uh, teamwork model here. It's more like a special operations team, you know, like a military team, you know, or a, or a football team, something like that. Um, uh, it, it contrasts with the, uh, the individual model by sort of adding more people, but it's a tightly defined thing. Right? Now, I want to contrast both of these with a crowdsourcing model where you've got a very large number of people and it, those people uh, have complete sort of freedom to do whatever they want, whenever they want, just contribute however you know, they like. So take Wikipedia, for example, nobody is required, expected, forced to contribute. Nobody's required to edit any particular page. Nobody gets paid to do this. Nobody, they, they do have some roles, but the, the massive editors don't have any official role in Wikipedia. Right. But uh, they do manage to do some really interesting things. Uh, you know, crowdsourcing can get you good, good results under, under the right circumstances. Um, crowdsourcing in intelligence, though, is a bit of a problem uh, for various reasons. Uh, pure crowdsourcing, uh, you know, like a Wikipedia mass public participation, you know, sort of model. Um, so we're actually working more on what we call a group sourcing model where you've got a large pool of people. So imagine this is all the people in, within an intelligence agency, um, but for particular problems, you've got groups of people who coalesce out of that larger group in, a, in perhaps an ad hoc fashion, or maybe the degree of permanence of these groups could, be, could vary. Uh, but the, the idea is, um, uh, we call this group sourcing, which I, I was amazed to find out only recently, is not a, not a very much used term. I think it's an obvious alternative to crowdsourcing, uh, but um, uh, there it is. I'm using it, uh, and uh, I felt like tweeting out just to just to claim priority. You know, just say I was the first to tweet the term group uh, uh, group sourcing. Uh, but um, uh, nevertheless, this is this is the idea. So, so Swarm basically works on a group sourcing model, and um, and to get, to make that work you have to underpin that as, as you, people in this community would know more than anybody, you need to un underpin that with the right kinds of, of technological supports. And uh, so uh, the, what the technology you have affords possibilities of collaboration. That's, that's a sort of an obvious uh, point. And so our challenge in the Swarm project is to design the technology that affords the right type of, of uh, free group source type of collaboration on intelligence products. And so we've ended up with a platform that uh, looks like this and uh, doesn't look like, just doesn't look very fancy or flash or anything from the outside. Um, it's, it's designed to be very familiar, simple sort of interface. You know, you don't have to go through three hour training programs or, you know, anything like that. You can jump on familiar stuff. Um, on the left, there's, there's a, a pane where there's some kind of problem statement. You know, this is the challenge you, that you've got to deal with. Uh, on the right, you've got a chat pane so that so anybody who shows up can talk with anybody else who's there. 
And uh, in the middle, we've got the main working area uh, where people can paste, can write their ideas and contrib contribute their ideas. And once I've put my ideas into that, into that centre space, other people can see what I've contributed and they can comment on it or they can rate it. We've got a rating widget. And, uh, and, uh, and what happens, a bit like Stack Overflow, people contribute their ideas and uh, other people rate and, and the good stuff gradually just sort of floats to the top. And whatever is at the top, when the bell rings, right, that's, that's your team's answer. Right, it's a really basic structure. And, uh, uh, you know, this, that's pretty much it, really, that swarm. And uh, there's a few other bells and whistles, but uh, the uh, it, 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 system, you've got your central workspace, which I was just describing. You know, alongside it, you know, we've got a learning center. You can take some online courses if you want. Nobody's up there asking you to or forcing you to, but, you know, there are some courses in certain aspects of reasoning. Uh, there's a help center with various articles and so forth that you can refer to if you want. There's something we call the lens kit, which um, is, is just a compendium um, of good things to know about thinking, about analytical reasoning. Like, it, it, you know, it, it really helps to, to be familiar with certain sorts of cognitive biases or to be familiar with uh, certain uh, rules of logic or, you know, principles of probability or, or principles of causal reasoning or principles of evidence evaluation. Or, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff that a good, uh, an expert reasoner will have more or less at their fingertips, much like a good GP will have a great deal of knowledge and know-how that they've acquired in their medical education and their experience as a doctor. Uh, they just, you know, if somebody walks in and they've got a particular pattern of spots, right? The GP doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't sort of drag out some principles of medical inference and so forth and work through some abstract reasoning. No, they go, oh yeah, I've seen that, you know, <laughs> that's, that's probably, it's either measles or it's whatever, and here's my test for measles. And in other words, they're drawing on a whole lot of um, useful know-how and knowledge uh, that, um, uh, that they apply flexibly to the situation. And the lens kit tries to reflect that aspect of what good analytic reasoning is about. So this is something that, that uh, people on the platform can just dip into whenever, however they like. So I'm really emphasizing this idea of freedom. In fact, we, call it, we use a technical term for that. We call it latitude. Right? It's a really important principle about Swarm. Latitude is the idea that as much as possible, allow people to be free agents. Allow them to figure out how to allocate their own effort. Because if you do that, the, the idea is you're, you're most likely to get the most value out of that person. Now, that's an empirical claim. Uh, it's, uh, some people would disagree, uh, but, um, and, and it's not always as efficient as you would like, uh, but uh, compared with other systems, it might be the best. Right? And so uh, latitude is very important. And um, one, one of the things I'll really emphasize about, about Swarm and how it works is this idea of, of contending analyses. So the basic idea is pretty simple. Remember that, that, that poor intelligence analyst in the cartoon I, I put up there, right? That person is going to have a particular way of thinking about the problem they're dealing with. They're going to bring a sort of analytical framework to that problem. And hopefully it's a good one, but it might not be the best one. I mean, maybe somebody else would have brought, brought a better one to the problem. And so the idea of contending analyses is that you'll get better reasoning if as a group you can generate and share multiple different ways of thinking about a problem. And if the group's got a way of doing that and figuring out which one of those is the best way to think about the problem and then agree that we'll go forward with that one and, and shape that up, right, that, that, that's the way to get better reasoning. And, it, you know, it's, it's so simple, right? It's a really basic idea. Yeah, let's, let's try multiple different ways of thinking about this problem and choose the best one. Um, and yet, uh, and this is what Swarm is built around this whole idea of containing analysis. So each of these... Um, uh, you know, the, the, in the abstract, those three things, down, uh, uh, document things, correspond to those blue things in, in the central pane, which are uh, what we call reports. That is, uh, draft or schematically uh, drafted reports that represent a particular way of responding to this problem. And uh, people put up multiple different drafts, and other people can, can rate these drafts for what we call readiness. How ready is this draft to go forward as our collective response to this problem? 
And readiness could be rated on multiple different criteria, and there's seven different criteria. And so you, you can see that in this particular case, the, the group uh, that has coalesced to work on this problem has rated uh, that particular top report very high on all the criteria. They're saying, yeah, this is really ready, right? It, it, across all these different you know, respects. You know, so the group is saying, yep, we're happy, it's good. Go with it. So um, that's, a, that's the idea of contending analyses. Uh, it's um, not a new idea, you know, it's, it's digging back into fundamental principles that have been known for a long time that, um, you know, cognitive diversity is good, uh, multiple different viewpoints is good, right? Uh, and we're saying, how can you make that work in an online environment? That's, that's really what we're grappling with is, can we design this so that it uh, just uh, makes it seamless and people don't even have to think about it, right? It, there's no instructions that says, I mean, the background reading there is, but in the platform, there's nothing that forces anybody or directs anybody to say, okay, now you need to generate an alternative perspective, right? We just say, look, here's the platform and, and rely that people will have different ideas. And some people will want to put up a different idea. They'll go, I, look, I think you would need to think about it differently, right? So give them a space. It's, it's like affordances and nudges rather than structure and directions. So uh, that's, in, in, in essence, that's how Swarm uh, how Swarm works. As, as, I, uh, as I suggested before, um, you know, we got some pretty good results out of it. And um, so we're continuing to develop, evolve the system. We have lots of ideas about how we, we could improve it over the next few years. And um, uh, by and large, the, the users responded very well to it in, in our survey of users. You know, they, uh, um, you know, when we asked them questions like, well, you know, did, did this help you produce better reasoning? And they said, well, yeah, pretty much it did. And, um, uh, you know, is it good for intelligence analysis? Yeah, it's pretty good by and large. Uh, always a bit of disagreement. But um, uh, one thing that I'll highlight here is the second bottom one, the yellow one. Participating in the 2018 challenge was a valuable learning or professional development experience. Now, this, this is data from a, um, actually, this is 2018 challenge data, right? So this has included a lot of people who are professional analysts, right? They work in organizations or they're professional analysts who we recruited from the internet. And, um, and that's, that's actually the strongest. See, that's the, the point at which they most strongly agree, right? is that this was a valuable learning experience. Uh, so that's, that's encouraging because um, we are working with organizations, uh, at least one, one serious organization that is, um, that is running workshops on Swarm because they think, look, this is a good way of developing uh, an, you know, uh, analytical expertise in our analysts. And so this is, a, you know, it's early days, but, but they're recognizing, yeah, this is good part of, this is good professional development experience. So, what I'd like to do now is just briefly talk about, uh, very informally, about some of the ways that I think it's working as a learning uh, environment. So we have no data on this. My, I feel like in my bones, I've done a lot of evaluation of uh, learning, of, of, uh, of gains over one semester um, in, in, in crit critical thinking, you know, things like that. And uh, we don't have that sort of data at the moment to show quantitatively, what sort of gains are we talking about here? But I feel it in my bones that this is working better than anything we tried before. <laughs> now, that will be tested, I have, you know, it'll be borne out, you know, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. But, um, but I think there's some plausible mechanisms that would explain that, that benefit that it, that it appears uh, to have. So I'm now gonna jump over a bunch of other slides which are really, really interesting, but don't have time now to uh, uh, to talk about, we could come back to them uh, perhaps a bit later if uh, if you've got um, the appetite. But um, here here are my quick thoughts on Swarm as a as a learning environment, and it's basically you know it's no one thing. People learn in many ways uh, on Swarm, and in a nutshell, you know by observing others, social peer learning. Uh, by getting feedback, rapid feedback on what they do, uh, by actually a self-directed study, by, by uh, teaching themselves, uh, and, and by being taught by others, actually, by getting guidance from others. And, I, and, and all I wanna do now is, I mean, these are all really basic, obvious ways that people learn, right? And uh, so uh, I just wanna illustrate 
how this sort of thing happens on the Swarm platform. So, uh, so here, for example, here's a diagram uh, that was created by a particular participant in the course of trying to, that, that person's team trying to solve a particular problem on the platform. And um, it's an investigative problem. It's like, who poisoned you know, this particular character? And um, so this, uh, they created this thing uh, called a binary tree uh, to efficiently represent a set of complex narrative type hypotheses. Um, the, uh, the, the idea is when you try doing an investigation, who, does anybody here watch uh, Death in Paradise? Right, you know, it's, it's this show, it, it's a British drama, uh, you know, murder series, police series, which is set on a Caribbean island. And at the start of every episode, someone gets murdered. And then the rest of the show is about how they, you know, how they figure out who did it. And there's always multiple narratives, right? They can, it, it, the, the audience, the viewer constructs multiple narratives. And the idea is you need to judge which of those is true. And of course, it's always a narrative you didn't think of, right? So, uh, the question is, how do you represent and evaluate those narratives? And you know, most of the time we don't do it in any structured or systematic way. What this person tried to do was, was use this, what, what that person called a binary tree to evaluate these, uh, to represent and evaluate these narratives. Now, look, I'm not sure it was successful or anything like that, but, but what I, I did know is I, and I've been thinking about critical thinking and so forth for a long time, I had never seen that before. This was new to me, the idea that they, that they would try to do it that way. I look at it and go, oh, wow, I would never have thought of that. You know, I, I have never thought of that, right? And so I had, in that very moment, I had learned something just by observing, by seeing somebody else grapple with the same problem, but doing it in a different way. And maybe it's successful, maybe it's not. But I've learned something. I've, I've expanded my horizons in terms of analytical reasoning just by being there and thinking about the same problem and seeing a different one. You know, pretty simple. But but this I think is a really important mechanism. When these teams get onto the platform, um, they uh, they're not that isolated person. You know, working on their own paper, they're um, they're very rapidly seeing alternative ways of thinking, possibly better ways of thinking. And that's a powerful mechanism. So uh, secondly, uh, I mentioned about the rating widget. Um, people create stuff and then pretty quickly, much more quickly than the, the typical academic setting, they get feedback from their peers. And this is part of doing the job together is to give each other feedback on, on what you're doing. And it, literally, you know, ratings and relative rankings, right? That, this emerges quite rapidly. So we all know that, that good quality and rapid uh, feedback is a critical ingredient in learning. And that's what seems to be happening uh, on, on the platform, is, that, is they're getting that fairly rapid feedback. Sometimes the feedback is not getting any interest at all, not getting any reaction at all. Right? Yeah, I, you know, I did something and nobody engaged. Well, that's learning, you know, you learn from that too. Right? Uh, so, uh, so that's another mechanism, rapid uh, uh, feedback. Um, another thing that happens quite a lot is uh, the participants, uh, you know, they're grappling with problems and they go off and they think, gee, I, I don't know how to tackle this. I wonder if there's anything uh, in the, you know, in the lens kit that might actually be useful here, right? And they go off and they look around and they learn some stuff. They try to bring it back. And you can see this, these are just chat, you know, just things I've just screenshotted out of the chat sessions. You know, uh, so this one in interesting here, Gecko 316. I'm a policy analyst who spent the last week Googling probability puzzles and Bayes math and oh gosh, what the crap am I doing? So far, uh, this has been a gigantic challenge and a learning, and a learning experience, right? So here's, here's somebody who um, clearly has been given a challenge and has said, well, I'm just gonna go out and try and learn about this stuff and figure out how to try to, have, you know, how I can do it. And uh, again, I mean, I, there's nothing radical innovative about that. I mean, the idea that people should go out and find out stuff about how they might tackle a problem is, uh, you know, a very obvious and common, you know, strategy uh, that, that, that no doubt, uh, as, as people are educators in this room, you would encourage your students, you know, to do. I'm just interested to see it hap how it happens in amongst other staff in the platform. Uh, so, um, 
Yeah, I'm looking through the lens kit again. I thought I'd try and have a look at the means, motive, opportunity section. Seems to fit in nicely. Uh, the, uh, oh, so this person's contrasting various different ways you might tackle uh, a different problem. So, but you can, it's also like you, can, you can see the learning in action right here in, in, these, uh, uh, in these comments. So uh, finally, uh, people generally in a very kind of nice and friendly and helpful way actually educate each other. Right, they try to help each other out. And again, this is reflected in, in the chat. Uh, so uh, the, uh, here's, uh, I like this one here, uh, uh, Gecko 952, um, they're talking about a uh, counter-terrorism type problem set in a fictional Central Asian country called Kalukistan. And uh, Cocker 2679 you know, talks about interrogation. Gecko comes in and says, well, actually, I, have, I know about this stuff and then you can see, in a, in a, in a gentle way, Gecko 952 is educating uh, Cockatoo 679 about this, about this area, right? So this, again, it happens, it happens quite a lot on the platform that people help each other out by, by helping, you know, upskill other people in various ways. Uh, so, um, so basically, uh, I don't know why that's there. Um, that's, that, that's really all I wanted to say. It, 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 it's, as I said, we haven't evaluated this. We, uh, we haven't got any data on it. But when you consider that there are these mechanisms in place, it is pretty plausible to me that there's a lot of good learning happening. And it's completely undidactic. Right? It's not sit through my PowerPoints while I instruct you in how to be a good critical thinker. Right? It, it, it takes for granted that people are in a community of practice and that they have a shared motivation to perform and that they want to help each other. And in that context, you know, a lot of learning can actually happen. Now, one of the reasons we're excited to be working with, uh, with folks here at UTS, particularly uh, Simon, is that people around the University of Melbourne have, have looked at this and said, actually, you know, this platform, um, we would like our students doing this kind of stuff. Uh, and so the, from a number of different directions, we're, we're having people saying, you know, this, you, you, yeah, we know you're building this for intelligence agencies, but um, could we try it out? You know, could we maybe use a version in our teaching? And so um, I think the prospects are quite good that some version of the platform, and it could even be used as it is, uh, but, you know, looking forward, some version of the platform, you know, gets deployed in educational context. And then, um, then what, what we start to get the, see the possibility of is, you know, this, this is a cloud platform, a lot of data gets gathered, and you can start to try to correlate that data with, with learning outcomes and, and see, you know, um, what seems to be effective? What, to what extent are these different mechanisms happening? You know, there's all sorts of questions you could ask. So that there's a lot of learning analytics that could, you could possibly do once you start putting this into a learning, uh, treating it not as a, I mean, treating it as a learning environment rather than, you know, all this learning that I'm pointing to is a side effect of uh, a performance environment. Right? But uh, uh, you could even do learning analytics in this context, but, uh, but yeah, it's, that's uh, an interesting possible you know, direction. Okay. Over there. All right. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Ted. <laughs>